All right, first of all, I want to start off by apologizing for not having podcast up last week. I was up in Portland performing with my friends Tom Hamer, Gregory Taylor, and Mark Hendrickson at the PNCA there. I also did my stand-up comic routine, which sort of doubles as a max workshop. I did that at the Control Voltage store, which is just an amazing shop. And I got a chance to meet an awful lot of interesting people, not only new friends, but a lot of people that I've only ever met virtually before. So folks like Mr. 808, uh, anyone with an analog heaven history is gonna understand who that is. Met Dave Fulton, uh, met a lot of really interesting people who all seem to be gravitating towards Portland. The place is really, starting to select itself as being quite a center for both art and interesting uses of technology. So this week we are going to be talking to Ben Bracken. Ben is a really talented guy. He uh, works in a lot of different media. He works with in collaboration right now with a woman named Ashley Bellowin. As a pairing, they actually build instruments that they then perform upon. If you get a chance to see even photos of their work, you'll be blown away by what it is they're creating. It's uh, something that they describe as kind of like a monochord. If that means something to you, great. If not, you're going to probably want to do a little digging to see some of the stuff that they're up to in terms of the physical characteristics of these instruments. So in this interview, I spent some time talking with Ben about a couple of particular things that I was curious about. First of all, I kind of pin him down on some of what it was like to go to school at Mills. But Ben uh, reveals some of his feelings and some of the way that Mills works. It sounds like such a creative place to be. The other thing though that we dive in and talk about fairly extensively is the process and the realities of collaborating. Ben has done a lot of collaborative work over the years and he seems to know what he's doing with that. Right now his work with Ashley is really getting a lot of notice. They're starting to collaborate with uh, additional people. So it sounds really exciting, but really kind of diving into the collaborative process is something that I was really curious about. I knew Ben would be able to shed some light on it, and he absolutely did. So let's hear our discussion with Ben Bracken. All right, this week we're talking to somebody, he's a co-worker, but he's also an incredible artist across many domains. His name's Ben Bracken. Uh, he's an amazing cat. Uh, he seems to know. He has taught me so much about Max over the years. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, uh, hi, Ben. How are you? Hey, Darwin. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for the introduction. Yeah, well, sure. Uh, thanks a lot for taking time out of your schedule to uh, talk with us. I'm going to try and break out of a, a interview pattern that I've had, which is to just blurt out, you know, tell me about your background and then have people <laughs> talk. And instead, I want to talk about some specific things because I kind of know you and because you're uh, pretty open in your CV about what you've done. And I want to talk specifically about your education at Mills College. Uh, I know that you got a, an MFA at Mills. Yeah. And uh, did you study undergrad there too? or No, Mills is kind of an interesting um, college in that the undergrad is entirely... Uh, it's all women, oh. so so actually the graduate program, which has been you know going for many years now, uh, is you know both men and women uh, attend. But uh, yeah, so okay. Well, color my face red. I didn't realize that, that was the case. <laughs> yeah, I mean sometimes when I'll mention Mills to people, um, they'll get a little confused because they won't know actually about the music program. They'll just think of it as a women's college. So. 
uh, they'll, they'll kind of give me a sideways look. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, that's interesting because I think of it just the opposite. I think of it as a music school that has an incredible history. Exactly. Yeah, you know, growing growing up in and around electronic music stuff, uh, I remember the pictures of you know. Uh, different pieces of equipment that actually were labeled with Mill's name and its interaction with the uh, San Francisco Tape uh, Center and all that stuff. It uh, it has this really rich history. My question is, how do you go there and deal with all the ghosts that are in the hallways? <laughs> um, yeah. So, like like you said, M- Mills kind of had this mythical existence in my imagination before I went there. Um, I remember seeing pictures too and reading in different books and publications about this really rich history. So um, going there was kind of a fantasy of mine for a really long time. In between undergrad and grad, there was about a six year period where I was just kind of playing music and um, working at a record store in Ann Arbor. And so by the time I got to Mills, I was really ready to dig in. You know, sure. I had I had spent a lot of time away from academia and um, had developed a lot of ideas out, kind of outside of that world, but then was kind of ready to get back into the fold, <laughs> as it were. Um, so yeah, when I when I went there, it's 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 hard not to think about all this great stuff that has happened there. But actually, while you're there, you're just kind of working really hard. And, and kind of immersing yourself in, in the things that you're interested in. Um, and it's a really, I would say, it's a really nurturing space. So a lot of the people who are working there currently um, are just really looking to facilitate the students um, going there. So the support system is just incredible. And that comes both from the teachers and the students. You know, the, the, every group that goes through there is really different. I was really lucky in the sense that I went to school with a lot of really talented um, people and got, drew a lot of inspiration from them, you know, as well as the awesome staff and faculty there. Sure. How many, uh, like, what was the size of the cohort that went through graduate school with you? I would say it's a two-year program, um, and there's the music um, department is kind of divided into three areas. There's the electronic music and recording media, which is what I did, okay. and, and then there's the kind of performance major, which is yeah, kind of dealing more with like instrumentalists, and then there's the composition program. So, so I think in our group there was probably um, maybe eighteen to twenty something like that so there's you know there's that plus whatever is overlapping from another year right but that's that's a nice sized group because you're going to get to know everybody but it's going to be diverse enough to actually provide a pretty wide spread of inspiration yeah for sure and i'm still uh, you know, collaborating and working with a lot of people that I met at Mills uh, while I was there. So that's that's a really great takeaway that I, I was able to walk away with. Their electronic music and recording media, which I guess is the uh, study area that I find pretty fascinating. How directed of a program is it? Do they have like a step-by-step approach to teaching or is it more a collaborative environment between yourself and the teachers um, as a way of pushing the envelope for you? They definitely mix it up. So there's kind of a, um, a track that you follow when you decide to do the electronic music program, but there's a lot of flexibility within that. So I ended up taking a lot of classes in the art department, for example, because I, I was really interested in video and took some like an installation art class and things that kind of fall out of their the electronic music programs purview per se but they're still really supportive of you kind of exploring uh, other other areas other offerings at the school that's, Um, that's interesting yeah so the other thing that they have which is really nice is that they have kind of a program set up for people to do a lot of one on one classes with people with um both faculty and staff. So, for example, when I got 
into Max, actually, it was because of uh, our coworker and friend, Les Stuck, who is on staff at Mills. And so we had a really awesome practicum, basically, where he uh, helped me realize a, a performance rig that I was building. So that was your first interaction with Max? Well, Max, it, it's strange. It, I, I would say that um, my first real software kind of uh, programming environment type thing was actually Super Collider, um, which is also kind of a big part of the program over at Mills. But I, I remember getting a CD um, back long, I don't even know, maybe like in 2001, that was like an enhanced CD-ROM type release by um, this guy, Christoph Charles. Right. And on on that CDR, there was a Max patch that he had used to make to realize the the music on the CD, and so I remember kind of picking apart that patch, um, you know, soon after it was released, but not really understanding it, but kind of using what was in that patch um, in my own performance rig. But it wasn't until I got kind of midway through Mills where I really dug in and. Yeah, I learned so much from Les. He really opened up a, a whole world to me. Right. Now, it's it's really interesting uh, that you study with Les because Les has this very uh, broad brush approach to to art. He does composition. He works with dancers. He uh, he does video work. And it seems like uh, in addition to learning some Max from him. You also apparently took some career pointers because <laughs> I would say that uh, of the people that I know and I work with, you probably have the broadest range of things that you do. You know, so I know that you're doing, uh, you're DJing like some soul night, uh, <laughs> which is sounds pretty awesome, quite frankly. Uh, you've worked and toured with bands like like the Date Palms. You've been doing installation work and composition work and performance work with uh, your partner, Ashley Bellowin. Is mm-hmm. that how I pronounce it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, it seems like uh, you've sort of taken taken on a, a persona similar to him, which is this ability to embrace a large number of different and seeming seemingly widely variant kinds of artwork. First of all... How is it that you allow yourself to be comfortable in all these different venues? Well, I think I get bored really easily. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I definitely have this thing where, especially I, I noticed this when I started performing solo years ago, that I would just, I had this real hesitation to do any piece more than once, you know. So I would I would build a whole piece just for one performance and then completely ditch it. And so... I have this kind of desire to keep the gears moving. And I think that working in different mediums and kind of with different ideas and with different people and different tools just really keeps me going, you know. Uh, I think that if I really focus too much on, on one thing for too long, I, I don't know if it would, I'd be able to sustain the interest and drive, you know. so. I find that kind of hopping to different projects that are using radically different tools or different ideas kind of helps me. Um, I can even come back to an old idea that I was working on before once I've kind of been reinvigorated in some other area. But yeah, I mean, for example, one of the things that Les taught me while I was at Mills was that he basically thought of Max like this a toolbox that he would use when he didn't have another tool to do what he wanted to do, <laughs> you know? Right, the tool of last resort, yeah. <laughs> right. But, I mean, that's just in terms of what I took away from last, like, that was a big thing for me. And it turns out that I often don't have the tool that I need. Right. <laughs> so I, I'll turn to Max a lot. Well, it's really interesting to me that the way that you combat boredom is by is by taking on new projects. When, If you look at sort of the history of the work that you do, do you tend to like rotate from music to visuals to installation? Or do you tend to have like a burst of energy in one area and then a burst of energy in another? 
Yeah, I would say that there are kind of longer sustained kind of periods of interest in different mediums. For example, the the work that I've been doing with Ashley over the past couple of years has really picked up a lot of steam and and it's something that um, I've been working on quite a bit. But even that project has, it really started out as a project for uh, building instruments. And so we had a couple ideas for, for instruments then, you know, after the instruments were built, it was like, oh, we need to figure out what to do with these things. <laughs> and so the, the project kind of developed from fair, there. So then it started to turn into a, more of a project about building compositions based on these instruments. And then, you know, it's kind of even further developed. Now we're kind of moving into this phase of um, doing a lot of recording. And we're going to be, we've been working in the studio and we're, we'll be going to a friend's studio up in Petaluma in a couple of weeks to actually get some nice recordings of some of these pieces we've been doing live. Sure. When you talk about instruments, are you talking about like virtual constructs or are you talking about physical devices? So uh, I guess about two years ago, we had a residency at a place here in Oakland called the uh, Paul Drescher um, Ensemble. I can't actually remember the name of the the um, actual residency, but um, it's funded and, and supported by this uh, guy, Paul Drescher, who is an instrument builder as well. We actually built uh, two instruments that in the physical realm um, that are basically large string instruments. I think there's 36 strings on both of them, and um, they're kind of what people call monochords, but I don't really know if it's that's technically a good term for it, but it's, you know, mini strings over a kind of uh, resonant hollow bodied instrument that we, that we perform live with. One of the things that I find myself kind of, it's, it's kind of ironic because I working with uh, Ashley and building these instruments was such a great uh, way to kind of get away from the computer and actually build something with your hands. So, you know, being in a wood shop for like 10 hours a day is, very uh, liberating to the mind, <laughs> sure. Uh, for, for especially for somebody like me who's kind of behind a computer all the time, and you know, find that that was really a great release and just kind of a different focus. But it's kind of ironic because I always kind of move to these projects thinking, okay, I'll get away from Max for a bit and you know do something else, and then Max always kind of creeps back in somehow. <laughs> it worms its way back in. Yeah. yeah, it's like, this wasn't supposed to be about this, but then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, a reason for it, you know. So we've we've implemented a, a couple of tools uh, in our live set that uh, utilize Max for uh, some spatialization tools as well as some uh, kind of processing. I mean, in my head, I'm trying to envision what this is like, and my assumption is is it ends up producing sort of like a drone-like sound. Would that be yep. fair? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in fact, all the strings are tuned to the same note. Oh, so. okay. Yeah. Well, that must be really rich sounding then. That yeah. Sounds amazing. It's, yeah, they were originally built for a specific space, so all the measurements and the tunings and stuff that we used on the two instruments were based on a, um, a physical space up in the Marin headlands that we did a performance for. Oh, interesting. So did you, like, tune it to match the resonance of the space and stuff? Yeah, it was going to... It, it was an acoustic performance, so... Uh, we had to figure out a way to make these instruments as loud as possible. Um, mm. And that's kind of the solution that we came up with. And it worked pretty well. How does that, tra first of all, translate into something that's going to work as, like, re recorded material? And yeah. Then, and then secondly, if it was built for a specific space, how do you present that anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been a big uh, issue for us, is trying to figure out some of these very... Uh, site-specific or, or kind of performance-specific um, musical terms and trying to translate that into like a recorded document. The recordings that we've had um, done while we're actually performing in front of an audience are, are never really acceptable. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, there's always, you know, some wind blowing or some baby crying or, or whatever. So trying to figure out how to capture some of the same ideas is kind of challenging. And in terms of 
repurposing the instruments. We've actually, you know, since that performance, used these instruments in a variety of contexts. And that's been kind of exciting to try to come up with different ways to use these instruments that were maybe built for one specific purpose, but then we're kind of finding this really rich area of exploration with the with the instruments, just as instruments, you know. Sure. Well, I would think that, that something like that could actually, there would be a way to even figure out how to use it for like an installation, an unmanned installation rather than just a performance. Yep. It yeah, stri- and, yeah. It strikes me as, as having some interesting options there. Yeah. And actually the, the instruments kind of first started out, uh, we got really interested in alien harps, which are basically wind harps. Right. So we actually we built a, an installation while Ashley was at Mills. Um, she went there years after I did. The original prototype for these string instruments was actually a wind harp. So that kind of the performance uh, aspect of our interests kind of grew out of a series of installations that we did. Sure. Um, so it was kind of trying to. Uh, we kind of went the other way around. So we started out kind of with a installation uh, in mind or a series of installations in mind. And then we were trying to think of, well, we really like to actually perform too, you know. Right. Um, and and I draw a lot of inspiration um, from live performance, something that I'm really comfortable doing. And actually the, the recording process for me is can be kind of painful because – it's just the concerns are so different when you're sitting in the studio. So that's what we're working on right now is trying to trying to bridge that gap between the live performance and, and recording. Well, sure, and good luck. I think, uh, I think you actually hit something on the head, which is the kind of concerns and the level of shoegazing required in, uh, in the recording world versus the capturing excitement part of a performance it's really hard to make that transition yeah and I, I find that for myself it's it's really hard to do that with my own music I've I've been involved in a lot of recording projects that were kind of spearheaded by other people like my involvement with date palms um, they were a pre-existing band before I um, got involved and um, it was really fun for me to step in and be part of the um, you know the live band as as well as the the recording process, and that was just kind of you know just super fun. Like you know, and it was a bass playing, and it was very a very different kind of mentality. But when it comes to my own work, it's a little bit harder for me to get into the studio um, as a kind of medium or whatever. You kind of pointed to boredom as being one way that you <laughs> one mechanism you use to select what you're going to work on, but I look at I look at like the performance work that you've uh, already you've done in the last few years, which is quite a stack. Uh, your work with Ashley, your other work that you do. How do you how do you manage? How do you juggle that? Not I'm not saying from necessarily like from a time standpoint, but sort of mentally. How do you how do you allow yourself to set aside one thing and and embrace another when you may not be in control of that of, of when something is due or, or required <laughs> yeah I mean the the scheduling stuff is yeah I mean everybody kind of deals with that um, the mental space I find that you know when thinking about it it really uses different parts of my brain so you alluded to earlier, like I've been doing a lot of DJing over the past few years and I have a couple of uh, nights that I've been involved in. Um, One, especially that I've been doing more recently, which is a a night of all international music from, you know, all around the world. And that's just a blast. And it's kind of, to me, uh, uses a part of my brain that, for example, my music with Ashley, it just doesn't doesn't even go near. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, it's it's kind of more of a party atmosphere. It's you know just enjoying the music of kind of an ex record collector. <laughs> I, I try not to buy so much anymore, but my my <laughs> record collection is a little 
was a little out of hand at one point, but this is kind of a way for me to uh, justify its uh, continued existence. <laughs> right. So yeah, I mean, and and the the bass playing that I've done with Date Palms, and actually just last week recorded um, a track for a friend, Chuck Johnson's uh, new record, playing bass for him. And the bass playing is this kind of other, very to me, very uh, liberating part of part of music making that that I really it's just really enjoyable I don't have to think too critically about it I can just um, step in and, and play what kind of sounds good you know sure and and kind of helping out other people you know by stepping in so it I think it just comes down to finding different spaces in my brain that are kind of satisfied by these different outlets I do. I think that, like, if, for example, I had another performance uh, collaboration right now with somebody else that was kind of really intensive and thoughtful and covered similar territory, that from what Ashley and I would be what we're we're doing, it would be difficult for me to sustain that. You know, it would just oh, be sure. kind of too much, and I'd, I'd have to just kind of pick, you know, one or, one or the other. So. Um, as long as it fits fits somewhere in my mind, then it doesn't have too much overlap. I can kind of maintain those interests. So that that helps me understand how you cope with it. But there's another there's another thing I'm curious about is how do you think that I don't even know what the word to use. Maybe how do you think art patrons out there um, react to someone who they may see. DJing one weekend and doing an art installation the next. Do you think that? <laughs> I mean, I I'm, I don't know the answer to this. It's not a leading question. I'm just curious what you think because uh, it's not that I care because I, I tend to do something similar to you. I have a lot of different interests and I'm out to satisfy myself. But <laughs> maybe I I set a low bar for myself. <laughs> Too, right. My my question is, especially as some of this stuff, you're starting to do more things in uh, galleries and uh, in public art areas and stuff. Yeah. Do you ever worry that having too diverse of a portfolio actually could harm you? I think about that all the time because I just cannot escape this. <laughs> Basically, I I struggle with keeping a, a strong focus in one area for a really long time. And I think I look at um, some of my contemporaries, uh, especially in the art world, where they're really forced uh, or they feel forced um, to kind of nail down one shtick that they do um, and they you know do it really well, but then they're kind of backed into this corner of like, oh, you're the guy that always does the thing with the led ball or whatever it is you know <laughs> right. and that's your thing and you have to you know as long as you do that you're kind of accepted into the establishment and if you start deviating from that then there's kind of a either you know partially perceived i think but also a real issue of like maybe nobody's going to be interested in the free jazz banjo clown routine that you have you yeah. know? <laughs> the the flip side of it is, you know, I guess for me, I, I can't imagine anything sadder than to be pigeonholed when you're 22 and <laughs> never be able to escape that pod, right? Yeah. I have to admit, you talk a little bit about your solo work, but most of the things that you do that I'm I'm familiar with have been collaborations of some sort. And right now, uh, again, if I look at... Uh, the CV that you and Ashley have put together, um, you're doing a lot of work. What is it about the collaboration process that frees you to stay focused? Or does does the stuff that you and Ashley do kind of waver about in terms of what you're doing? I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the stuff yeah. that you see here, but it seems interesting that the collaboration certainly is long form. Yeah. Even yeah, if the material itself isn't. I definitely, and I think this is, as I've gotten older, I've become a lot more interested in collaboration. I, I spent a good chunk of my, you know, mid-20s to 
early 30s doing a lot of solo work and doing a lot of live performance stuff and some installation stuff and kind of the the older I get or the more experienced I get the more I value um, working in collaboratively part of it is that I just don't have enough hands to do all the things that I want to do, (laughs) you know? Sure. And and I'm not much of a top-down kind of person. Like, I'm not super interested in, like, um, ordering a a small army of people to do my bidding. Um, So I'd much rather actually involve myself in creative experiences that have a lot of input from people that I trust and, and people whose opinions I value. Um, and I just learn so much more. And I feel like the collaborations are just more meaningful too, because it's kind of greater than the sum of its parts where when I play a solo show, there's, that's it, you know, (laughs) I just, I put something on the table and, and that's, that's all there is. But with collaboration, there's all these kind of really amazing things that can take place that you never anticipated. And so I, I think that's why I kind of keep on coming back to that. And and more and more so, even Ashley and I's work, we're kind of reaching out to different um, collaborators. And we've done a series of collaborations with um, some filmmakers. Um, some are still in progress that are really, really gratifying. And especially working with filmmakers whose language is so different than than ours um it, it's been producing a lot of really interesting results well that's that's incredible so in in a collaborative environment what role do you find yourself taking you know yeah. do, you, do you find yourself being sort of like you know and i hate to sort of like label anything but a lot of times you know roles get sort of like parceled out where one person gets to be the hyper emotional artiste you know and another person is the grinded out person with the screwdriver or whatever um i'm just wondering how do you where do you find yourself sort of like naturally gravitating when when you're working on a collaboration well i can say music for musical collaborations i find a lot of room you know a lot of idea my ideas come with kind of uh, arranging uh, material um, although I, I'm super interested in you know generate, generating raw kind of musical ideas, a lot of the stuff that I find really satisfying actually has to do with kind of arranging pre-existing material. So once the material is somewhat generated, finding how it all kind of fits together. So and and I've been you know back when I was in pop bands and stuff like that, I would do a lot of the arrangements for the bands that I was in, and it's just something that I kind of gravitated towards naturally. Um, yeah and you know I would say that one thing that I'm not good at that I always (laughs) am excited when somebody else is is good good at it um, in a collaboration is uh, kind of the promotional side of things I'm really bad at you know keeping up a website or even making sure that the you know people know that the show is happening (laughs) so I've, I've definitely appreciated um, different collaborations that I've been where there's somebody a little bit more more motivated than that department. For Ashley and I, it really it's it's a really interesting collaboration in the sense that we share a lot of the responsibilities across the board because we both have a background uh, in recording and because we both know Max and you know we both have really strong interest in in uh, instrument building. There's a lot of back and forth that happens, and you know sometimes that can be difficult when we're kind of you know, working on top of, you know, each other. And there's a little bit of room for like, oh, do you want to do this? Or do you want to do, you know, right. uh, kind of back and forth. But but actually, it's it's been really, really great to kind of know that the other person has the skills to, to be able to kind of fill in when maybe you've run out of ideas or, you know, your tank is empty and, and you need somebody else to step in. Like, say, I've edited for something for four hours and my brain is fried and you know Ashley I'll have complete confidence in in what she does to take a step back and let her have a crack at it so sure that's really cool and it's not something that I think happens that often or it hasn't happened that often to me where it's been successful because usually you'll find collaborations and yeah it's it's good and important to have really kind of discrete roles often 
um, because the work happens a lot quicker right. um, if everybody kind of knows what they're responsible for. But this ha- it's been really gratifying because um, we have a lot of the same skills and interests, and it's been working well. What we're setting out there for our listeners is this concept that collaboration really can can help you be more productive and efficient as well as more inspired often but it's not always perfect in your experience what are the things in collaborations that end up being conflicts or where where do you end up seeing conflicts occur well i think you know this is probably no surprise but it's it's really comes down to personalities and i i really think that underneath even like the kind of some problems that come up that are considered maybe more technical in nature, it comes down to the people that you're working with, at least for me. And if you can kind of uh, navigate the kind of social space that you're in with somebody successfully, I, I think the collaboration is it's just, it's probably going to work on some level, you know. Besides your work with Ashley, you've collaborated with a number of people. How do you know when a collaboration is done? I mean, I I, I ask this because I have to admit, I've collaborated with a number of people. And sometimes, you know, you get the sense either that they're ready to move on or you feel in your gut that you're ready to move on. But it's a really difficult thing to sort of dissolve because of the high levels of emotion and trust and and, uh, respect that a successful collaboration produces. It, it also then sort of has this built-in sense of responsibility, like I'm responsible for this person in some way. Right. And, you know, I want to go, you know, I want I want to go and work with someone else. And, you know, is that like, I mean, it ends up almost like with all of these uh, spousal phrases, right? Am I, <laughs> am I cheating on my collaborator, you know? Um, <laughs> How, in in your experience, how do you know how do you know when a collaboration is done, and how do you approach that doneness? I'm, you know, again, I'm curious because it's not a thing I'm good at at all. Yeah, I think that for me, most of the time, what happens is real life kind of set, sets in on some at some point. So, like, you know, I've had so many times where it's there's some external force that determines whether the collaboration is going to continue or not. You know, somebody moves away or somebody gets a really great opportunity to do this other project and they just don't have any time logistically to work uh, with what you're doing together. I think it is interesting, though, like kind of knowing when some when, when an idea has been kind of seen through. And I think the times that I've experienced that the most has been have been in like kind of more like band type settings where, you know, after a record or something like that has been recorded, you're kind of like, okay, well that that was good, and and now we can all do something else. You know? <laughs> and 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 it's it's nice when it happens kind of collectively when you kind of both you know or whoever you're working with, the, everybody's on the same page. But I'm sure that that doesn't happen that often. And yeah, or often happens some other way, but yeah, I think I think sustaining long-term collaborations while kind of getting involved in in different things, different collaborations, um, it can be it can be difficult. One last question, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of wrap up. But um, when I look at the list of works that you and Ashley have been doing, you ha- you are generating a lot of work. I mean, it's listing here that you've already done like four performances already this year. Well, and there's been some lecture opportunities and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to ask the question that I think a lot of people out there are going to be wondering in their head, which is, where do you get these gigs, man? <laughs> yeah, I mean, with with the project that Ashley and I are doing, it's it's been really interesting to see that there's this really strong overlap uh, between the visual art world, and I think that's part partially because of how we perform, and there's also kind of a uh, tendency in the Bay Area for a desire to kind of keep like expand the the world of visual art. So you know, we'll get a 
opportunity to work with somebody who has something at Yerba Buena or up at De Rosa. Um, a friend of ours had had an installation that was a, a, basically a long string instrument um, sculpture um, that we performed on. So I, I think that last year, Ashley and I had a residency at a place called uh, Jurassi, which is a kind of uh, artist program in Woodside, California. Okay. And and we met a lot of really great artists there. And I think because our involvement with Jurassi and the connections that we made there, there's just a lot more. It kind of opened up a world that might that kind of expands beyond the world of like experimental music, for example. And so we're getting a lot of requests um, from artists that we might not be familiar with that are doing completely different things in a different medium. That's, that's really exciting for us to kind of, yeah, again, like it goes back to this, like being inspired by collaborations. The thing that we're going to be recording in a couple of weeks is for a project done by our good friend John Davis, who is working on a, a box set of a double LP DVD set of that is a bit of a compendium or, or a compilation of a couple of different visual artists paired with a couple of different um, sound artists. And the project is called uh, Gravity Spells. And it mm-hmm. it's basically... Um, going to focus on this Bay Area scene that where there's this collaboration between uh, filmmakers and, and musicians. Well, that sounds really incredible. Hope you'll keep everybody informed of that as that is coming together. Uh, do you and Ashley or do you personally have any other big plans or big projects that uh, that are coming up in the near future? Um trying to think just um yeah more collaboration with ashley we have a couple of um shows coming up uh as well as that recording project um we're hoping to try to release something um this year actually in a physical media to to get to people and yeah more dj gigs i'm gonna be djing a dj the third wednesday of every month at the makeout room in san francisco for international freak out a go go and then uh what a great name <laughs> yeah it's and it's fun it's a blast and then there's a arts organization here in berkeley california called kala arts and i'll be djing their 40th anniversary uh april 17th wow that sounds great well thanks a lot ben for your time i appreciate it and i appreciate you kind of uh being willing to uh entertain me with both my curiosity about Mills and about the collaborative process. I think that a lot of times people just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, collaboration, it works somehow. (laughs) And I think that it's actually interesting to sort of explore it and intellectualize about it a little bit. So I appreciate you being willing to skate along with me on that one. Yeah, thanks so much, Darwin. This has been fun. I mean, when you are forced to talk about uh, things like this. There's always kind of revelations for in it for for both the questioner and the questionee. So <laughs> true enough. Well, I hope that uh, you had a good revelation. I've learned a lot today. <laughs> so thanks a lot and have a great day. All right. Thanks, Darwin. And there we have it. Not only information about mills and about collaboration but also a little bit of information about how you juggle a career when you have a lot of different things going on so that's it for this week thanks a lot for listening again as always i really appreciate if you can turn other people on to this podcast and otherwise uh and i also want to again shout out to some of the people that have been supporting us particularly Cycling 74, my employer, great people there, all. And uh, the folks at Synthtopia who really help out by posting up uh, information about some of our more music-related podcasts. But I hope that you uh, find this interesting enough to share. And if you have any questions or comments, please shoot me an email, ddg at cycling74. I'm always happy to hear from my listeners. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.